Hey, grab your Bibles. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 34 this morning. Um, you're like, I didn't even know that was a book in the Bible. It is. Um, and it's in the Old Testament, which is in the left half of your Bible. Um, and so we're going to be talking about a, a young man named Josiah. Um, and he was eight years old when God used him to completely and radically change the lives of thousands and thousands of people in, in Judea or in the tribe of Judah um, and and in Israel to the north. And so um, let me give you a little background on what's going on here in Second Chronicles. Um, the book of Second Chronicles kind of parallels Kings and part of Second Samuel, um, and it deals with the southern kingdom of Judah and um, the northern kingdom of, um, of Israel. Now, the kingdoms were split. Um, how many of you guys have brothers or sisters? How many of you guys fight? How many of you guys want the right side of the, the, the room or want the, the best room? Well, that was basically what was going on with Israel is they were fighting, um, and so they split. After King Solomon, which is you know, David's son, after he passed away, the, the two kingdoms split. Judah went to the south, and Israel went up to the north. And uh, eventually, in 722 B.C., um, the Assyrians um, took, took out Israel, and, um, and then later in 586 B.C. is when Judea finally, or Judah um, finally went into captivity to the, to the Babylonians. You guys remember Daniel? We just went a couple, I guess it was... I don't know how long, it was a while ago, but uh, Pastor Ted taught through the book of Daniel, and it dealt with um, the captivity of Babylon and, um, and, and Daniel there um, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. And so this is kind of just before that, um, that this takes place. And so <clears throat> if you would, I'll turn to Second Chronicles 34, and we will um, read through the first few verses. Um, Josiah was eight years old when he became king and reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, when he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. They broke down the altars of the Baals uh, in, in his presence and the incense altars which were above or uh, which were above them he cut down and the wooden images he uh, the carved images and the molded images he broke in pieces and made dust of them and scattered it on the graves of those who sacrificed to them in verse 5 he also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem and so he did in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon as far as Nephtali um, and all around with axes when he, had, when he had broken down the altars and the wooden images, he beat uh, the beaten, excuse me, when he had broke down the, the altars and the wooden images, had beaten the carved images into powder and, and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Josiah was, was no joke. Um, a little background on Josiah is there was a king before him, his dad. The reason he took, let me back up a little bit. The reason he took the throne at eight years old is because his dad was assassinated. Um, he was assassinated. He was an evil king. Um, his dad's name was as Amon, and then his grandfather was even a worse king in Manasseh. <clears throat> and so Josiah was kind of up against um, this legacy here of terrible father, terrible grandfather, and so you would expect that he would follow in suit. At least that's the excuse that most people make today is that I had a terrible upbringing, therefore I am like this. And we know that that's not always the case because we see here in Josiah, verses one through seven, he talks about how he sought the Lord from an early age and he followed the Lord. He didn't look to the left, didn't look to the right, but he stayed focused on, on the Lord. And I think that's it's such an important thing for, for you and I because um, everything in this world is, is trying to get us to look to the left or look to the right. Guys, we can't drive down the freeway without seeing a, uh, a dumb billboard or we can't watch a commercial and then the, the Carl's Jr. commercial comes on and you just want to throw your controller through the TV. Um, only me, I guess, apparently. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the text says here that Josiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Look at verse three. I think this is the key verse here. It says, for in the eighth year of his reign, so he's about 15, 16 years old, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. Now, we know David wasn't directly a father, but he was from the tribe of Judah. And so um, David was one of the last great kings of Israel, was the, 
um, was one of the last great kings of Israel, and so he's following in David's footsteps. Now, how many of you guys are familiar with what a dirty, rotten sin bag that David was, right? But God still used him, so it wasn't that he was just so great and awesome. It was that the Lord's hand of provision was upon David. I mean, David uh, murdered somebody. He committed adultery. I mean, he, he did a lot of stuff that isn't exactly God-honoring, and yet it says here that Josiah followed in um, David's footsteps, and it was because of, of the Lord's hand of provision on David, not because David was such an awesome and righteous man, um, so anyways, I mean, you got to look at context here. What just happened in Josiah's life? His dad was murdered. Um, even if he was a wicked dad, I mean, he was still his dad. So there's a lot of turmoil going on in his life. He first, how many of you guys at eight years old were like, yeah, I'll, I'll be president of the United States. I mean, that's a lot for anybody, right? I mean, I wouldn't want that job for anything in the world. I wouldn't want that job. But to take over a kingdom at eight years old, that is... Um, that's no joke. And here, here Josiah has a lot going on in his life. And what does he do? What does it do here in verse 3? What does it say? He, he sought the Lord. He began to seek the Lord from a young age. Now, statistics show that <clears throat> the older you get in life, um, the older you become, <clears throat> the more wicked you become. No, the, the more set in your ways you become, right? How many of you guys have a grandfather or grandmother that you're just like, forget, I can't tell her to do anything. This is the way she does it. I mean, my, my papa, he's 83. Um, he comes here to the church. He's actually in, um, he's actually in, uh, where's he at? Alaska, mom. Thanks. My mom's in the front row. So um, <laughs> she, he's in Alaska right now, but he's still to this day mows his lawn. At 83 years old, he, he mows his lawn. He is set in his ways. He hasn't stopped working a day in his life, um, but to try to get him to do something that he doesn't want to do is absolutely impossible. It's, uh, you, you can't do it. I don't know, maybe some of you guys are like that at a young age, and if you are, I'll pray for your spouse, um, because um, the, the older we get, the more stuck in our ways we become, and the less, less open and receptive we become to, to Jesus and, and what he wants from us in our life. And so I think the key here is that he sought, day, or he sought Josiah sought the Lord when he was young, um, and, and seeking, is seeking the Lord the, the first thing that we do when turmoil comes, or does it seem to be the last thing that we do, right? It's the last thing that we do so often. It should be the first thing we do, and it, it's funny how we only go to the Lord when we're, like, in desperate need. We're in trouble, like something has happened, someone's sick in the family, someone dies, or um, what have you, and then we go to the Lord. But when things are going great in our lives, what do we do? We take all the credit because we are so awesome, right? Well, Josiah, what does he do? He seeks the Lord when he, when he is young. Turmoil is happening in his life. There's a murder. He's, he's tasked with running this kingdom in charge of God's people, which um, it's kind of a big deal, right? It's not like he's just in charge of just his family. I mean, this is, this is God's chosen people, the, the Israelites. And yet he's in charge of watching them. So he says that he seeks the Lord. Do you guys want change in your life? I mean, you got to expect that Josiah wanted change in his life. He didn't want to be, he probably never wanted the kingdom, especially looking at his dad and the, the influence, because he saw the, what the influence did in his dad and his grandfather, it ruined them. Power ruins people, not everyone, but power ruins a lot of people. And so you got to think Josiah is probably eight years old saying, you know, I don't want anything to do I don't want anything to do with my father, my grandfather. I don't want anything to do with what caused them all of this heartache, all this pain, and caused me to have such a terrible upbringing. And, and then here is Josiah stuck right in to running a kingdom. And it says that he sought the Lord early. So let me ask you guys a question. Do you guys want change in your life right now? There's something going on in your lives, no doubt. I mean, there's a couple hundred people here. There's something going on in your life that you wish wasn't that way. You want something changed. Well, so did Josiah. What did he do? He sought the Lord. Change is going to come when you seek the Lord. That doesn't mean you seek the Lord and all your problems go away, because that's not how Christianity works. How does Christianity work? You seek Jesus, you become saved, and life gets much harder. But, but the Lord just makes it bearable, Right? He's the one that pulls you through it. It's not as if you give your life to Jesus and, and it's all candy, game, candy canes and puppy dogs and fairies and gray and walking on rainbows. That's not the way Christianity works. In fact, it's much, much worse. I was watching this video yesterday. Um, 
It's about this pastor in Sudan who was a, who was a Muslim, and he, he gave his life to, to Jesus. Um, and so and he became this evangelical, and you know, his church started to grow. Um, they said his church is around 1,000 people, and out of those 1,000 people, 300 of them were ex-Muslims that have converted to Christianity and that gave their life to Jesus. And so he was outside of his church, and uh, someone was like, hey, pastor, I have a question for you. So he turns, and then these Muslim um, terrorists have acid, and they dump acid on his face. And his eyes gone, and he, had to get, he has to wear this pressure mask just to keep his face intact. And that's what following Jesus um, means. It means that trial and hardship will come, but he was praising the Lord through those trials, realizing that Jesus gave him the influence to be able to speak into people's lives and to make a change. And Jesus has given you guys influence to speak into people's lives and to, to make a change. And Matthew 6, 33 uh, says this, <clears throat> and I like the way it says it in the New Living Translation. It says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. That's not everything that you want. That's everything that you need. Uh, New Living Translation, or excuse me, New King James Translation says this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And here's the key of that verse. It starts with seeking Jesus. We want so many things from the Lord, like why is my life such a mess? Why, why, are, why are things not going the way I planned? Jesus, I profess you, I go to church on Wednesdays and Sundays and Tuesdays and Fridays. Every day of my life I go to church and yet my life is still a disaster. You're like, what do you want from me? But we fail to do what? We fail to open up his word and actually dig in and seek the Lord. The Lord's desire is that he would speak to you. This isn't a mystery. This book isn't a, um, with the hidden messages. This is God's desire that we would know him and that we would make him known. But you guys can't find out who Jesus is if you don't open this up and dig in. Because we, what's the, uh, I'm bad with, my wife, she, what she likes to do is do like, sayings, like, I don't know, I can't even think of them, but she always botches them. She puts like two of them together. It's like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't get out of the kitchen because it's hot or whatever, you know? So she like mixes two together. But Jesus is like, look, I, I've led you guys to, to the water. Just drink of it. You know, Jesus has made every provision for you to know him and to make him known. But you are the only one that's stifling that. I am the only one that's stifling that. If my desire is to know what Jesus wants for me, which it is, then what do I need to do? God, if you don't speak to me, I'm, I'm, not gonna be, I'm not gonna follow you. Well, how about if you don't open up his word, his words are right here, his desire is to speak to you. That's on you. You know, this, just preparing this this week, it was super convicting um, because I tend to go to um, God's word in a few different times. One, when I'm preparing a message for the students, Right? I'm like, okay, Lord, what do you want to speak to these heathen little kids? Right? Um, you, they're your kids, so you know how heathen they are. Um, no, we have, a great, um, we have a great youth ministry, with the exception of Dane and Susie who are up here. Um, but we, I, I tend to go to the Lord, what, when I want something. Isn't that the way it is? How about we go to the Lord because he is worthy, and because that honor is due him, and because he wants to speak to you. So first, Josiah sought the Lord, and then he acted. Jo- Josiah began to tear down the altars in Ju- Judah and in Jerusalem. Read with me. Verse 4, it says this, or excuse me, verse 3, for when he was eight years old, or excuse me, for when he was in the eighth year of his reign, he began to, or while he was still young, he began to seek the Lord um, of his father David. And in the twelfth year, when he began to purge Judah, and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. They broke down the altars, and the text goes on to say that Judah, uh, Josiah left no altar erected. What was going on in the time of, of Second Chronicles is idol worship was running rampant. Um, they would erect, I mean, little statues, uh, golden things. I mean, you name it, they worshiped it. Um, and, and so Josiah, what does he do? He seeks the Lord for wisdom. How do I run this? How do you run your kingdom, Lord? What do I do? And then his next action is what? First, he sought the Lord. Okay, what would you have me do? This is practical time for you in your life. Kyle, or what do, I, what do you want from me? Kyle, what do you want from me, Lord? Okay, now I know. Now what? Oh, well, that was good knowledge. I'll just sit on that. No, the gospel requires what? Action. 
The gospel requires action. And if we don't have action behind it, then all we're doing is puffing ourselves up with head knowledge and not using it anywhere. So Josiah, he seeks the Lord. And then secondly, he acted. Josiah began to purge the kingdom of all of its idols. And, and why? Why do you think he did that? Well, I mean, you gotta think that Josiah sought the Lord. The Lord spoke to him, right? It doesn't say that, but you have to assume that the Lord spoke to him. And then what? The next thing he did was what? Got rid of the idols. How many of you guys, our idols look differently today than they did back then, right? How many of you guys are familiar with modern day idols? What, what, what do some modern day idols look like? Um, Josiah knew that by eliminating those modern day idols, that, that true worship of God would come. Josiah knew that eliminating Israel and Judah of all of its idols would cause the people to turn to God um, who could actually fulfill the need that they were seeking after in these shiny things. Why is it that we, why is it that we so easily want to worship idols? I mean, it's so easy. I mean, I'll get into them in a minute, but you know, your cell phones, your, your celebrities, your, your, your cars, your money, you know, yada, yada, the, the, the list goes on and on and on. And I, re, I think the reason that it's so easy for us to, to go to idol worship is because we were created, we were created and we were designed to, to be worshipers. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I'll put it up on the screen, but if you want to turn there, um, this is a good verse to, to underline because what Paul is speaking here, or Peter is speaking here, he's speaking to us, those who are believers, those who have trusted in Jesus for our salvation. He says this, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. And this is the part that sticks out, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into this marvelous light. We were created to worship Jesus. We were created to know him and to make him known. I was created that I would raise my family up to know Jesus, to love Jesus, and to serve Jesus. If I fall short of that, I am, I am going to um, be held accountable for that. Dads, you guys are held accountable to raise your kids up to know the Lord, to serve the Lord, and to seek him. If you fall short of that, you are in sin, and you will have to answer to the Lord. And that's a heavy, heavy thing to say. That is heavy. And now, taking your kids to church and raising them up in the Lord are two completely different things. You can take your kids to church on Sundays and on Wednesdays and not raise them in the Lord. There's a difference. Raising them in the Lord is bringing church home, reading your Bible to your kids at home, praying with your kids at home, telling them why we follow and serve Jesus, not because it's the Ten Commandments or not because the Bible says so, but why? Because that is, our, that, that is what the Lord desires from us, is that we would know him and that we would worship him. You will worship something. That's not the question. The question is, what or whom will you worship? We were created to worship. We were created to glorify and exalt the Lord. And if you don't put those energies towards the Lord, you will put them towards something else. So what is modern day idols? Really, it's anything that takes the preeminent place in your heart and in your life. Anything that you dwell on and you can't stop thinking about. Anything that you wake up in the morning and go, uh, and that's the first thing on your mind, those become idols in our lives. I, I wrote a list down, and you can fill in the blanks if I didn't hit yours, um, but it says self-image. So going to the, going to the gym um, obsessively. Um, I go to the gym, but not as much as I should, obviously. Um, your spouse can be an idol, your kids, your job, your social media, your friends, your money, sex, drugs, politics, sports, for me, fantasy football, phones, education, and celebrities. These are just a few of the idols that we have today. Um, I, I, I wrote down a quote here. I, I don't know. Someone smart wrote it. I, it wasn't me, so I can't take any credit, but I'll read it and say I did. So idolatry um, it's actually up on the screen. Uh, I just, it stuck with me. So idolatry is rooted in a deluded understanding of God. We undervalue his worthiness, dismiss his holiness, disregard his love, dilute his truth, and forget his jealousy. We begin to erect idols as our affections drift away from the exclusive worship he requires. Ouch. I know that hit me right between the eyes. 
because we begin to value things more than we value the Lord, don't we? It's because we have a false understanding of who Jesus is and who, who God is. God requires and deserves our undivided 100% worship. Anything short of that is just sin. And I know I was super convicted this week. Um, idols look differently today. I mean, I was really convicted this week. So last Friday, I, I went out with my wife on a date. We went to, um, we brought our, our little son Judah with us, which is, he's little, he's four months old to, tomorrow, today, something like that. Um, and so we brought him with us, but we went to Sorel. Um, have you guys been to Sorel before? It's like the small little restaurant that you don't want to take kids to. It's like really dark. I mean, it's a really cool place. But anyways, we bring Judah there, and we're having a good, a good dinner. And uh, inevitably, um, this thing is blowing up, right? And I'm just doing one of these. Look, my, my Bleacher Report at just came up right now. and told me about my Niners. Alex Boone expected to report to camp. That's great news for Niner fans. Um, but this is what happens. I was like this, and I didn't realize that I was like this. You know, my wife's sitting across the table, and I'm like, yeah, I love you. Um, you're so beautiful, babe. Um, and I'm doing my thing, and, um, and she doesn't say anything. It's typical woman stuff, right? She didn't say, she didn't say hey, why don't you put that down and pay attention to me? She lets me just fall into my sin um, so that she can tell me about it later. <sighs> Guys, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Why don't you stop us, ladies? Help, do us a favor. We are dumb. We are dumb. We are dumb creatures. There's a reason the Bible likens us to sheep, okay? <laughs> so I'm on my phone, and, and my wife, on her way to ice cream, then she turns up the heat and was like, we're having a, a conversation, if you will, on a date, mind you. And she's like, you're always on your phone, you know? Like, you're always, I'm like, it's work stuff, babe, obviously, you know? Uh, I got texts and fancy football updates and um, so I'm, I'm like, babe, no, I'm not. What are you talking about? Yeah, of course, I have email, you know, but I didn't realize how much I was on my phone. So what I do is um, I, I deleted all my social media apps. Um, I took off Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, yeah, those are the ones I had on my phone. So I took those off my phone, um, and it's been seven, eight, nine days now, and uh, I didn't realize how much of an idol it was until I took them away. Um, and how much it, it, it took away from my, my kids, how much it took away from my wife, um, and the second I didn't have that stupid screen in front of my face or down here under the table trying to be sly, my wife's not dumb, um, the second I took that away, I realized that that had become an idol for me. Now today, for me not to have a phone is, seems astronomical, but um, I got a phone when I graduated high school when I was 18, and so that was um, like 12 years ago almost, and um, I didn't have a cell phone then, and, and I look at my cell phone now, and I I, I can't, like if my phone hits 50%, it's on the charger. Like that's how pathetic I am with this thing. And um, it, you know, it, 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 we can laugh about it and we can say how funny it is, but the truth is, is it was, it was stealing from my family. This phone was stealing from my family. It was stealing from my girls. It was stealing from my wife. And uh, it wasn't until I, I got rid of the idol that, um, it wasn't until I got rid of the idol until I really realized how detrimental it was. Some of us, we, we worship on the altar of our own pride and, and self-image and ego. Um, you know, obsessing over our careers and jobs and our social status. Uh, many, many people spend, millions of people spend 68 hours a week working, working on the weekends, on their phones like me, constantly, constantly, constantly working, and we do it in the name of, of providing for our families, or we're doing it in the name of, of, of making sure our kids have a better life than what we had. And really, that's, it's untrue. What we're doing it for is to get ahead or to get socially accepted by people or to be really successful so that we can look good or look promising and have that social status that, that we are craving, and, and it's folly. All of our laboring and accomplishments will be of no use to us one day when we're standing before the Lord. Um, King Solomon, um, he, he says it best. He says this in, in uh, Ecclesiastes 2, um, chapter Chapter 2, verses 21 to 23, it says, For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This, too, is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all, that he, for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days, his work is pain and grief. Even at, my, even at night, his mind does not rest 
this too is meaningless. That right there sums up millions and millions of people. Statistically, maybe half of you guys in here is that we working, working, working hard to provide for our family. And we say it's provide for our family, but really we're doing things that, that doesn't need to be done. While our kids are sitting by starving for attention, they're starving for the love and attention that, that, um, that we as, as fathers and as mothers need to be giving them. Um, do your kids, you think your kids are going to care if you, get, if you get that promotion? Do you think your kids are going to care if you, um, if you get that raise? Or do you think your kids are going to care if your boss, you know, gives you a high five or says that comment that you've been waiting to hear your, your whole career? Do you think your kids really care? Do you, you think they want to spend time with you? We, we bought a trampoline for Bella's birthday. She's five. Um, and we, um, it was right after I deleted all my apps, and so we went outside to, um, to jump on the trampoline. I was sitting in the chair while my two-year-old and my five-year-old were jumping in the trampoline, and she, my Bella's been trying to do a hula hoop for, for weeks, and she just can't figure it out. And, um, and so I'm watching her, and she's like, you know, Dad, look. And so I, I've been, I, I'm watching them, I'm watching them, and all of a sudden she puts the hula hoop on, and she just starts going and going and going. It was like, it was just the coolest thing. I know it's not riding a bike, but that's my bike story. Um, <laughs> that I, I was able, because I was focused on what was important in my family, is that I didn't miss that opportunity. I wasn't looking at my dumb phone. I wasn't preoccupied with the, the Trojan game or the Niners. Or I, was, I was focused on what was truly important, you know, and, and she was so excited that I saw it for the first time. Her eyes were bigger than saucers, and she, like, was so ecstatic, like she had just won the, you know, the Super Bowl or whatever, and, and, and Dad was able to share in that moment with her. And it was, just, it was just super sweet. It was rad. Um, and so what, what are our idols keeping us from? Think about it. Think, think of just your phones. How many of you guys wake up in the morning? And I know for students, I mean, I, I normally teach the high school on Sundays. For our, for our junior high and high school students, if I were to say, what's the first thing you do with your phone in the morning? It's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, social media, right? That's what they roll in their bed, and boom, they check how many likes they got on their picture. You know, um, it's, 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 con- it's consuming. It's consuming. We, we send our pictures out. I was talking to, my wife was talking to uh, one of the, the girls in the youth group, and she was talking about selfies, which are, for those of you that don't, that, that's a selfie. You just take a candid shot, or sometimes you're looking in it, uh, the picture, and, and you take a picture, and you put, put it online, and my wife was talking to one of the high school girls, and um, somehow selfies got brought up. She's like, oh, yeah, you know, I take probably about 50 before I find the right one, before I post it, but before I post it, I send about five pictures to all my friends to, um, to get the okay of which one I should, and then when they narrow it down to the two or three, then I take those two or three, and I look them over, and then I really decide which one I should post. And you know what, it's, it's, um, it's not her fault. Um, what it is, it's society telling her that if she's not perfect, if she's not beautiful, if she's not spotless, then she's not worth anything. And that's what an idol will do. It, it, will, it, will, um, it will cause you to worship something that was never meant to be worshiped. You look at celebrities like you fill in the blank. And what happens when you start to worship them and when people, they get this fan base, like Justin Bieber, for instance, right? He started off, you know, this, I guess, this Christian kid from Canada. Um, I watched his first movie, and, you know, it was, it was clean, and it was wholesome, and then he started to become worshipped, and it ruined him. Now he's um, egging people's houses, multi-million dollars egging pe- people's houses. He's getting caught, getting high and drunk, um, and this is all because he is someone that um, it was never meant to be worshipped, and when idol worship... Um, is had on something that's not meant to be worshipped, it ruins them. And so for you guys, that thing that you tend to, to worship, it will, ruin, it will ruin you. I'm going to go back to that quote because I think that it, whoever wrote that nailed it when he said that idolatry is rooted in a deluded understanding of God. We undervalue his worthiness, dismiss his holiness, disregard his love, dilute his truth. I mean, that's a huge one right there. How many, how many of us are, I mean, how many things have you seen just in the news about God's word being diluted, being, being conformed to what the world wants it to say instead of what it does say? 
and forget his jealousy. God is jealous for you. What is the number one commandment? Love God. What's the number, number two? No idols. Love God and cut out your idols. Why do you think those are the first two? Because those two right there, if we get those right, then worshiping Jesus is the only response we will have. We get those two mixed up, we will start going after other things to satisfy our need, to satisfy the hole that's in our heart. Because we were bent on worship. We were meant to worship. The question is who or what will we worship? Not if, but what or who will we worship? We begin to erect idols as our affections drift away from the exclusive worship he requires. Another, another form of uh, an idol, and I'll keep this one short and sweet, um, is, is money. Where your money goes, so does your heart. If you guys have a hard time giving to others, giving to the church, giving to the Lord, your money's probably an idol. If what you've done is, if got yourself in so much financial trouble and debt that you can't afford, then you've got your priorities all messed up. The Lord requires more from us. You know, there's a, there's a term, put your money where your mouth is, right? It's like, got super quiet in here. <laughs> and I think this, this is why. No one likes to talk about money. I don't like to talk about money. But you know what? I know that the Lord has blessed me. I know the Lord, my wife can stay home from work. We have three kids, and the Lord has blessed me, and we've never missed a meal never missed a, a rent payment, never missed a bill, and we're not eating top ramen every night. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Jesus loves me. He takes care of me. What is mine is not mine. It belongs to the Lord. For those of you that are not giving, you need to give. Not to me, not to the church. You need to give to the Lord. If, that, if your heart is pounding like this, it's probably because money is an idol for you. And that's not my idol. I have plenty of other ones. Think about it. Because the Lord, what does the Lord want from you? The Lord wants your whole heart. And what do idols do? It keeps us from worshiping Jesus exclusively. It keeps us focused on other things. Modern, modern day idolatry is, is what's holding us back from, from truly worshiping the Lord. I believe that, um, I believe that idols are, are what's causing America to go in such a decline that it's not even funny. We have this idol of, of self, of our own, getting ahead or um, having to keep up with, with the Joneses or whatever your next door neighbor's name is. You know, we feel like if we don't have that new thing, then we're going to be looked at differently or judged. I mean, it's so sad with the high school students today and the junior high students. Like, I remember growing up, you know, I didn't have, like, all the newer clothes. And so I bought these, like, my mom got me these shoes that were, um, they were from, like, uh, Payless or something like that, you know, because that's what we could afford. But they were, like, kind of knockoff skate shoes. Skate shoes were, like, cool at that time. And so my mom did the best she could what she got. And she got me these, these, like, skate shoes, but they weren't, like, skate shoes. And so... What did that do to a kid? Like, I'm just like, I was so excited to go, right? Here I am with my new shoes. I was so excited to go to church or uh, to go to my friend's house, and they have the real deal on, and I just felt like worthless, you know? And what a lie from the enemy to tell you that if you're not doing this or you don't have that, then you're not worthy. And some of you guys are believing that lie about yourselves even today. Some of you guys are, are sitting there um, d depressed or sad or lonely because you don't have what you, what you always thought you wanted to have. Maybe you don't own a house or maybe you don't own that new car or maybe, maybe your kids can't go to that, that private school or maybe, you know what, all that stuff doesn't matter in light of eternity. What matters is that are you loving God, are you honoring God, and your kids love God and your kids honor God. Idolatry is keeping millions of millions of Americans away from following and serving Jesus. The question is, are we going to take a stand for righteousness against that? Or are we going to sit quietly by as the world is lying to our, our, our youth, the world is lying to our children, telling them that their self-worth is in what they have? 
Parents, that's on you to speak into your lives of your kids. They desperately need you. My job isn't to get your kids to love Jesus and to love God. That's not my job. My job is to get them to see Jesus' love for them and then in turn that will change their lives. Your job as parents is to get, is get your kid to see how much Jesus loves them and that will change them. That will give them their value. Their identity, your identity is in Jesus Christ alone. Not in what you have, not in what job you have, not in how much money you make. The key is in loving and serving and worshiping Jesus. Verse five. He also burned the bones of the priest on the altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. That is gnarly. Josiah goes crazy here with his idol worship or with, with, with taking down and, and removing the, altar, or the, the idols. Some of you guys would be like, that's a little overboard. You're like, yeah, I'll get rid of the apps on my phone. That's an easy one, Kyle. I'll, I'll stay away from this or that. But, you know, I can't, let, I, I can't sell this car that I have this lease on. Or I, I can't do that. That's, that's too much. Even though it's strapping you down from really being able to serve the Lord through your giving, I can't do that. That's asking too much. You know why? Because then I'm going to have to drive this, this beater car, and everyone's going to know that I'm not really that well off. Josiah took getting rid of idols very seriously. I mean, it says here that he burned the bones of the priests on their altars. So these are the priests that had already sacrificed to these idols and, and generations ago, and he digs them up. He digs up dead people, grabs their bones, and burns them on the altar. Why? Because he's sick? No. To, sh- to take a stand and to show his nation, to show his country that they are no longer, they are no longer gonna worship idols. That they're gonna take a stand for righteousness. And some of you guys... You guys need to take a stand in your house. You guys need to do something dramatic and drastic to change the course of your family. Some of you guys need to hear that right now. He didn't take it slow. He didn't take it easy. He didn't care what people thought of him. I mean, people probably thought he was a weirdo for digging up old people's bones and burning them. But he didn't care what people thought of him. Who did he care about what thought of him? Jesus, or the God. He cared what God the Father thought of him. Are you willing to purge the idols that are in your life? We can hear this message and we can think that it's good, or maybe you don't think it's good, I don't know, but we can hear this message and the choice and the decision is up to you. Are you willing to purge those things in your life? And for each one of us, it's different. Not every one of us is gonna have the same idol. But there are idols in our lives for sure. Verse eight Skip down to verse eight for me. It says this. Now I'm gonna preface this section with a bunch of weird names that are hard to pronounce, so don't make fun of me. Um, In the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azela, uh, Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. So, Josiah, he begins with purging Israel and purging, purging Judah, the southern kingdom, of all the idols. He even goes up north into, um, into Israel and purges those idols because at this time, Israel had already disseminated um, by the Syrians. They took him over, and then some of them had integrated into the southern kingdom or were, um, or, or were killed in the, the captivity. And, uh, and so Josiah goes throughout the, all the land, purges all the idols, and now he says it's time to go repair the temple, um, the temple in Jerusalem. So um, as, as, you can, as you can imagine, when you have centuries and centuries and, and decades and decades of idol worship, the temple, the true, true place of, of worship, is, um, is typically forgotten, right? Like on Saturday night, when you guys do something that you don't necessarily, something you're not supposed to do, Sunday morning is super hard to get up. I know for the high school students, when they're up late or they're doing something dumb, then all of a sudden you start not seeing them around as much. You call them like, oh, yeah, I've just been busy with aliens and ate my homework and I can't show up to church anymore. But you can tend to see when people are not doing well, they, they, they tend to stop coming to church or that the things get neglected. And so here the temple is being neglected. And so basically um, Josiah gives, um, gives his orders to Shaphan and, and like basically the people like his, his council in the, in the, 
in the kingdom, and they say, okay, I want you to go take some money. I don't want you to go to the temple, and I want you to clean up the temple. I want you to put things back in order. So they go to the high priest there, um, who is, his name is Hilkiah, um, and, and so they're, they're working. It says the foremans are, are working. They're putting in new floors. They're making it beautiful, and then in verse 14, it says this, now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah, the high priest, found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And when Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law and the house of the Lord, and Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. So Shaphan carried the book to the king, bringing the king word, saying, all that was committed to your servants they are doing. In verse 17, it says, and they, have ga- uh, and they have gathered the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and the workmen. So here they are. They're, they're cleaning, they're purging the, 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 the temple. They're, they're fixing it up, and they, found, they find the, the lost book. Um, now, this is the... the part in Deuteronomy chapters like 5 through like 25. Um, it's basically the, the law. When Moses came off Mount Sinai with the two tablets, with the Ten Commandments, um, this is what they found. And it says the book was lost. Now, we know that the book wasn't lost because um, you go back to in Deuteronomy, um, it, it says that uh, a copy of the, the commandments were to be kept in the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the temple. And so anyways, the, the idea here isn't that the that the, um, the book was actually lost, like no one had heard it. It's that it was lost in the sense that no one was reading it, no one was abiding by it. No one really, they were indifferent towards God's word. Is the Bible lost in your home? Is the question. Do you guys have, I have like, 25 or 30 Bibles at the office. I just collect them. Kids leave them. It's awesome. I get Bibles, and I can give them away to other people. Um, and I have this whole collection of Bibles. But what do they do? They just sit there and collect dust until I'm able to give one to somebody. A lot of you guys, your Bibles are at home collecting dust, and you never really open them up except for on Sundays. I know that's the way it was for me growing up. So I would say, is the Bible lost in your home in the sense that it's neglected or you're indifferent towards what it says? If we truly believe that this is the word of God, that this is his love letter to us, don't you think you would open it more often? If we truly believed that these are the words of life, I think we would open them. How many of you guys are sentimental people? I'm not. How many sentimental people out there? Girls, okay. Um, My wife writes notes. I'm like, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. That's not the way I receive love. If I were to write her like a love note or something like that, she'd probably keep it. She probably has ones I've written her when I was like 15 and I was like, I'm just trying to go out with this girl. I'm gonna write her this cute note. She's gonna love me forever. She keeps that kind of stuff. Well, if this is God's love letter to us, we ought to open it. We ought to open it. We ought to, we ought to read it. We ought to know what God wants to tell us because he wants to speak to us his goal isn't to be so mysterious that we can't understand it and we shut the book and we're like, oh, forget it. And this is exactly what was happening here in, in, Ju- in Judah. Verse 18 and 19 say this. It says, And Shaphan the scribe told the king, uh, saying, Hilkiah the high priest gave me this book, and Shaphan read it before the king. Thus it happened when the king heard the words of the Lord that he tore his clothes. Josiah's response to God's word is Repentance. He tore his clothes. That was a sign of repentance. I mean, Hilkiah says that he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He didn't look to the left, didn't look to the right. He heard God's word and what did it cause him to do? To repent, realizing that he was a sinner. Realizing that his good works weren't enough. No matter how good we are, we still fall short because God God is perfect and we are imperfect. God came down into broken humanity to fix us. Our righteousness is as filthy rags, it says. And Josiah, hearing God's word, was grieved over his sin and the sin of his, of his people. And what does he do? Verse 20 and 21. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, 
and Hakim, that guy, the son of Shaphan, Abdin, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, the, the servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to the, all that is written in this book. Josiah is grieved over his sin. He's grieved over the condition of his nation and his country. And what does he do? He sends people, go inquire of the Lord. He turns to the Lord. So many of us, that's the last thing I talked about earlier. That's the last thing that we do. We, we come to the Lord only when we are like in our pathetic end of the rope stage. That's not the way it should be. The very first response from us should be going to the Lord. Not our last resort, but our first option. So Josiah, he sends people to go um, and to inquire of the Lord. And so um, verse 22, it says, So Hokiah and those the king had appointed went to Hulda, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the, the son of Tokath, the son of Hasherah, a keeper of the wardrobe, and she dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter. So he says, I want you to go inquire of the Lord, go find out. And so in those days, they went and found this prophetess, this one that was the Lord would speak to her and that she would speak to the people. Um, and just as a side note, in this time, Jeremiah and Zephaniah were prophets on the scene. But for some reason, um, you know, Josiah doesn't, they don't connect with, uh, with, with Jeremiah or Zephaniah. Um, actually, Hilkiah is the great-grandfather um, of Jeremiah. That was just kind of a cool side note. Um, verse 22 or 23, it says, Then she answered them, and thus says the Lord God of Israel. So context real quick. They read the book. He tears his clothes. He's repentant. And you know, in that, in that section of Deuteronomy, it talks about the, the condemnation and the, um, the wrath of God that's going to be poured out upon Israel if they don't turn back to the Lord. And so thus says the Lord God of Israel, Hulda says, uh, to the man who sent you to me, 24, thus says the Lord, behold, I will bring calamity on this, pe- on this place and will, lost my place. Uh, behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on the, its inhabitants. All the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger, with all the works of their hand, therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and not be quenched. Verse 26. But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall, keep, you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself, because, um, and, and bef- you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words, against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which, will, which I will bring on this place and its inhabitants. So they, f- they brought back word to the king. So Josiah sends his people to go inquire of the Lord, and they, they meet up with this lady, this prophetess, Hulda. Parents must have hated her, name her that. Um, but anyways, they found her, and she, she spoke this to the Lord. She said, Israel is in a lot of trouble because of their disobedience. But because of the obedience of Josiah, I will prolong my wrath. And we know that in five, 586 B.C., um, Babylonians came in and finally took the southern kingdom of, of Judah, and this, pro, uh, this, this prophecy was fulfilled in that. But it wasn't fulfilled during the time of Josiah because he sought the Lord, because he was a follower of the Lord and did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 27, there's three things I want to look at of why Josiah was spared it says he was tender hearted towards God's word. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you. First thing is he, he had a tender heart towards God's word. 
Is your heart tender towards God's word? Do you, do you act upon God's word? The second one is in the second part of that verse. Josiah humbled himself before the Lord. Let me tell you, the alternative isn't fun to be humbled. And I've been there many times. And the third thing is, is he repented. He tore his clothes. Does your sins grieve you? Or do you just say, Lord, just forgive me and go back on to your, your way? There's a difference in asking for forgiveness and repentance. Forgiveness is like doing a 360. You're sorry for a while until you come around doing it again. Forgiveness is a 180 where you turn around you run the other way. 29 says this. Then the king sent and, um, sent and gathered all the elders of Judah in Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all men of, of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites, and all the people, great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood in the place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all of his heart and all of his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. And he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin take a stand. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Thus Josiah removed all the abominations from the country that belonged to the children of Israel. And he made all the who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord, their God, all the days all his days, they did not depart from following the Lord of their fathers. Josiah makes a vow before the Lord and before his people to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments with all of his heart and all of his soul. You know, it says here that Josiah does something pretty cool. It says he made Israel take a stand. He made them take a stand against idolatry and made them stand for the Lord. question is we're not if we will worship it's who or what we will worship will you guys stand for righteousness will you guys purge your house purge your life purge your family of the idols we stand for righteousness and worship jesus instead of idols